Clint asked me to begin, and I'm just going to do this in a personal way, just representing myself, not anything else. I want to first share a really short poem by one of my favorite poets, um, Jane Hirschfeld. Um, it's called Global Warming. Uh, it's five lines long, um, and it's sort of like uh, having a bucket of cold ice poured on your head. <clears throat> At least that's how I feel. Um, it starts, it's this way. Um, when his ship first came to Australia, Cook wrote, the natives continued fishing without looking up, unable, it seems, to fear what was too large to be comprehended. So that's the short poem. And I <clears throat> um, agree with Sarah that I feel the momentum building, but I'm just going to share also kind of some factoids that have hit me like um, cold buckets of ice and they have to do with temperatures in the oceans and recent studies. Um, so Massachusetts and the Northeast as a whole saw its third warmest year in recorded history in 2021 with average temperatures two degrees above normal and nearly four degrees above the 20th century average. Um, and as you probably read, the Northeast is warming faster than most of the world. By the time that global temperatures increase by two degrees Celsius, the Northeast will have experienced a rise of three degrees. Um, there was a recent new report about the oceans from a scientific journal showing that in 2021, the oceans contain the most heat energy since measurements began six decades ago. And since the late 1980s, the oceans have warmed at a rate eight times faster than the preceding decades. And that long-term warming is particularly severe in the Atlantic. And as you know, that warming is destabilizing Antarctic ice shelves from underneath, which could um, lead to the collapse of large pieces of the ice sheet threatening massive sea level rise. So, I think a lot of people think that climate change is going to boil down to a warmer new climate, but that's not the deal. We no longer live in a stable climate. It's the stability issue that's really critical under, to understand, and that instability is worsening. And essentially, this terrifies me and brings me a great sense of um, urgency to act um, on climate now. So those are the... <clears throat> The settlements that I'm start starting this year with, and um, the only way I find <laughs> relief from them is is to to try and do more and act more and take action. Um, so, Kent, that's my introduction. Hey, thank you, Dory. I think also uh, being networking with other people and joining together to to try and do something about this is what we need to do. Well, so. Sorry. Without further ado, uh, Sarah Dooling is uh, joining us tonight, and uh, she is, uh, I met Sarah actually in on the streets of Peabody a couple of months ago during an action campaign against the uh, Peabody fossil power plant that's planning to be built, and uh, got to know her a little bit and, and her organization, and she's doing wonderful stuff. Uh, she has quite a background. I'm not going to read it all to you, but you should know that she's been a wildlife ecologist and she worked in Missouri, Florida, and Maine. Uh, she also then went into social work and finally did a PhD in environmental planning at University of Texas at Austin. So she's now the uh, executive director of Massachusetts Climate Action Network and she, she is going to uh, tell us now about some of their work on environmental justice. So welcome, Sarah, and again, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you uh, both Dory and Kent for, for that lovely, if uh, sobering introduction, Dory and Kent for your kind introduction of me. Um, and as we all know, the land and sea are connected and how we uh, regulate our built environment clearly, directly and indirectly in influences what happens in our oceans. And so what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is gonna be focused pretty much exclusively on why the state uh, investment in a um, gas and oil powered peaker plant is, is misguided. 
Um, but a large part of MCAN's other work, Mass Climate Action Network's other work, focuses on buildings um, and getting our buildings away from being polluters and becoming a core climate mitigation tool that can protect our health um, and, uh, and protect our communities overall. So with that, I am going to share my screen. So just bear with me while I get up my slides here for, for us. Okay. All right, one moment. Let me get into presentation mode here. Okay, here we go. Is that visible to all of you? Thumbs up, fabulous. Okay, so as Kent uh, mentioned in his introduction, uh, I'm the executive director at Mass Climate Action Network. We are an educational and advocacy organization with over 65 chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, across, across the Commonwealth. And we really believe um, that working at the local level um, is uh, one very strong pathway for affecting change statewide. So we all we always work with local advocates historically on things, everything from climate action planning, speed up to today. And we're working increasingly on things like opposing um, fossil fuel investments in fossil fuel infrastructure in communities where there is a municipal light plant. And I'll talk about what those are in a minute. Uh, we also try to coordinate our local advocates to affect statewide change. And we uh, were one of the core organizations um, that really helped get the next generation roadmap bill over the finish line, which included FYI uh, provisions for buildings uh, and, and for the state to develop uh, what is called a net zero stretch building code. Um, and I can certainly answer more questions about that in the Q&A. Uh, I think in my opening remarks, I'm really going to focus on uh, our work associated with the PVD Peaker plant. Mass Climate Action is the only organization in the state that focuses on what are called the municipal light plant utilities. You know, our energy sector, we have the uh, investor owned utilities like National Grid and Eversource. Uh, but there are also 14% of our electricity in Massachusetts, our power in Massachusetts is generated by this other set of utilities, uh, commonly referred to as municipal utilities. Um, so Wellesley was the first uh, town at that point uh, back in 18, 1882, I believe. That's when the first municipal utility uh, was, was set up in Massachusetts. And now there are 41 of them across the state. Uh, and they are regulated differently compared to the Eversources and the national grids. And for a long time, they have enjoyed the benefits of being not regulated very much. Um, and, uh, and so that is changing. Um, and as a result of the climate bill, uh, which is now statute, uh, these municipal uh, light plants, these municipal utilities are now required to achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050. So just keep that in mind as I kind of go through the story of the Peabody Peaker. And so MCAN, as an advocacy organization, we were approached by uh, a town counselor in Wakefield um, who also acted as a liaison with their municipal light plant. And so Julie came to me and said, Sarah, did you know? Did you know that there's been this project under development for the past six years? Um, with, a, with a trade association called the, the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company. I call them, so MMWEC, MWIC, um, and MWIC uh, was the lead professional association that includes uh, about half of the municipal utilities as part of their clients. Um, and for the past six years, MWIC had been researching, developing, and then launching and formalizing uh, something called Special Project 2015A. And uh, when Julie came to me back in uh, last March, uh, she said, did you know that there's this new proposed uh, gas and oil powered peak plant being proposed by this professional association? 
And so a peaker plant is a plant that is turned on increasingly uh, when energy uh, demand exceeds supply. So on really, really hot days or really cold days. Uh, and that this 60 megawatt uh, peaking plant uh, was going to be, uh, pr was proposed to be built in, in an environmental justice community. And it was gonna cost uh, 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 $85 million, uh, $85 million for construction. And then they were going to refinance, uh, for another 85 million, uh, associated with maintenance of this particular kind of infrastructure. Now it's important to keep in mind that the town of Peabody, uh, already has, uh, so they are a municipal utility community and their local municipal utility, Peabody municipal light plant, already has two peaker plants on their property nearing their end of life. And so uh, when this uh, project was brought to MCAN, um, uh, we were astounded that the, the project was really going to expand uh, the existing natural gas infrastructure uh, and include a natural gas compressor. It was also going to expand oil infrastructure, um, including uh, a smokestack and a new tank to hold uh, a liquid, some aqueous urea associated um, uh, with the process. Uh, so this was all news to us. And when we um, looked into it further, we realized there are already two other peaking plants on site right along the river there in Peabody. And uh, a map in a minute will show you exactly where the, uh, the Peabody Peaker plant uh, will be built right smack dab in the middle of an environmental justice community in less than a mile than eight other environmental justice communities. Um, now, there's a series of legal ambiguities surrounding the project. So we have MWIC, the professional association. We also have uh, the Peabody Municipal Light Plant um, you know, they're also involved, but then the city of Peabody, where the third and new uh, uh, Pika plant is going to be built, is a, that land is owned by the city of Peabody. So there are at least three different players in uh, Peabody proper um, that are involved in, in, in this project. Now, at the end of the day, some very conservative uh, projections related to emissions uh, claim that emissions of up to 5,100 tons of carbon dioxide a year uh, can be emitted from this plant. MWIG disagrees with these projections. They come in with, an, uh, uh, with a much lower estimate of 7,500 tons uh, per year. And that's based on how often the peaker plant will run. Now, if you recall, these peaker plants are only turned on, you know, maybe a couple hundred hours a year. Uh, but however, this particular uh, plant um, is permitted uh, to run almost full time. So just keep that in mind. Now in this uh, map, you'll see here's the river, if you follow my cursor, flowing through Peabody. And this outlined parcel in red is where uh, the Peabody Peaker is scheduled uh, to be built. And I also want to emphasize that this is not just a local problem. Um, you know, when we think about the stationary sources of emitting and polluting facilities, um, you know, we tend to sort of think about the impacts uh, on, on the local, on local people. Uh, however, in uh, this particular uh, Peabody Peaker is actually co-owned by an original set of 14 municipal utilities that signed a 30-year contract. Now, it's interesting to note that on the far left, you'll see all of the, the municipal utilities that have signed the contract. Those two that have been crossed out, Chicopee, number two, and number four, Holyoke, they have requested to opt out of this contract because in the case, I believe in uh, Holyoke, it goes against their clean energy goals. So this is interesting and it's useful to note um, that towns, including Russell, really, really small. Um, you know, I visited Russell with my clean energy director uh, and this 
contract uh, for Russell, for Shrewsbury, uh, for Hull. Uh, these are all municipal utilities that in many ways are under-resourced. Um, they don't have the same access to state funds because they're not regulated in the same way by the state compared to the uh, investor-owned utilities. So there is some regulatory uh, legacies, if you will, about being under-resourced. Um, now, these, this PBD Peaker plant, the way the energy markets are structured in Massachusetts, this Peaker plant can sit in PBD, not get turned on at all, and make significant revenue for these, uh, now these 12 municipal utilities. So this, in many ways, is a revenue generating strategy uh, for the municipal utilities. But it's not all about money, right? When we think about polluting facilities and we think about the impacts that they have, especially in this case, locally, some of the immediate health concerns are related to what is being emitted uh, by these peaker plants. And this particular kind of particulate matter uh, that is emitted uh, lodges in the lungs, especially in the elderly and the very young. And the, the construction site uh, is across the street and not very far from an elementary, a public elementary school. Um, and so when you think about this particulate matter lodging in our lungs, uh, you know, this contributes and aggravates existing asthmatic conditions, as well as a whole host of other um, ailments. And, you know, at this day and age, when there are clean energy options, you know, this externality, if you will, this uh, burden is just not necessary. It's just not, it's not, we don't want this. Uh, so when we think about PBD specifically, this is already an overburdened committee, uh, committee, right, community. Uh, there, as I said, two other natural gas peaker plants already on site. There are uh, three different locations in the town where there have been toxic releases. There are 15 documented uh, sources of other kinds of air pollution, stationary sources, and there are about 85 sources of hazardous waste uh, being stored um, throughout the town. In other words, this is an already heavily polluted community and the emissions uh, added by this plant uh, do not exist in a vacuum. So this whole idea of cumulative impact uh, is pretty important. This is the map I was referring to earlier. So here's the river, the Danvers River. Uh, and here, right here, is where uh, the Peaker plant is scheduled to be built. And as part of the Next Generation Roadmap Bill that was uh, signed by Governor Baker last March, uh, different criteria uh, designating environmental justice communities were codified into law. And so here uh, to the left of the proposed Peaker site, um, this is a, a community considered an environmental justice community based on the prevalence of minority um, uh, populations. Over here, this is low income, this bright neon green. And then this dark green uh, uh, is a combination of minority and low income. Uh, so a lot of environmental justice um, uh, communities have suffered from the siting of polluting facilities in our state and in our country. And so when we think about the threat that this particular peaker plant poses in terms of NOx, sort of these, uh, these toxic pollutions, as well as the particulate matter I was uh, describing that lodges in lungs, as well as if you look at Peabody, it is, you know, kind of in the middle of all this very uh, transportation intensive um, uh, road network. So that threat combined with the long term vulnerability of folks living in Peabody to all of these polluting sources that culminates uh, in a very high risk that this particular Peabody peaker plant poses. Now, as part of the next generation roadmap bill that is now law, uh, part of that requires that projects like this must now involve residents living in environmental justice <clears throat> communities. <laughs> and two uh, ways forward in which uh, the PBD Peaker 
um, could have benefited from more information, more transparency, would have been to conduct what is called an environmental impact uh, assessment, but also a cumulative health impact assessment for this project. Neither of these studies have been conducted. And this is something that we are now calling on Governor Baker and Secretary Theo Herades to do. So with only eight years left, going back to Dory's opening comments, to mitigate against the worst effects of climate change, the very last thing we need in this state, the very last thing that the people of Peabody need is a $85 million new gas facility. Now, just briefly, MCAN did contract with a fantastic group of modelers um, and clean energy experts uh, associated with the clean energy group. Um, and, uh, you know, they make it their business to help dirty peakers, uh, that's gas and oil powered peaker plants transition to clean, uh, clean energy uh, technology, clean energy options, specifically battery storage. So they've, uh, there, this kind of transition is happening in Oakland. Uh, there is uh, a project called Plus Power, 150 megawatt um, or 350 megawatt hour battery project uh, in Massachusetts. It's going to be coming online in 2024. And then there's a project going on in Maine. So the Clean Energy Group did a technical feasibility assessment for battery storage um, uh, for the PVD Peaker plant. And this shows this graphic on the left. Uh, we sort of took some of their data and made it into a more visually digestible graphic. Once again, it shows that battery storage is cheaper, cleaner, and is feasible compared to the proposed gas and oil uh, design. So annualized costs, this is really comparing the costs associated with a four hour battery storage design. And you can think about batteries and the uh, number of hours uh, to store energy that is generated. You have four hour options and two hour options. The key thing with the peaker plant, it needs to be able to turn on right away because that's when there's this lull between the demand uh, and the insufficient supply. So the peakers need to come on pretty quickly. And so comparing a four hour battery storage option and a two hour battery storage option, the price, uh, the capital cost investment um, and the maintenance uh, comes in significantly lower compared to what is currently proposed, which is a 60 megawatt combined oil and gas peaker. And uh, I'm gonna pass the slides on to Kent and there is uh, the URL um, that you can uh, cut and paste into your, or copy and paste into your browser. And you can actually look at the report, which is very uh, compelling. So when we think about trying to redirect this investment away from fossil fuel, uh, health debilitating uh, peaker plant to something uh, that is more life affirming, if you will, uh, there are a series of benefits associated with clean energy technology like battery storage. Um, including the improvements to community health. We're not going to be, we, we don't want another emitting facility. And we actually, when we think about um, uh, resiliency, energy resiliency, and resiliency has many different messy definitions. And for those of you that are familiar with the idea of an ecologically resilient system, you know, you uh, have a disturbance, uh, your system gets reconfigured, there's turbulence. And then it develops into something a little bit more robust, uh, more able to resist um, and accommodate and adapt to uh, changing conditions. So uh, during a, a, a grid outage, when you have battery storage on site, um, you know there is less dependency on um, you know uh, uh, there's less dependency on making sure your oil and gas lines are up and running. Right, you can quickly get out energy from your battery stored units uh, into the grid and into into communities, especially when you think about people that are dependent on some kind of medical device uh, that needs constant um, electrification or constant power in some way. So when we think about evolving concepts of of um, reliability on the grid, increasingly what we are seeing is that, you know, and this came out of the Texas, the great freeze last year and here in Texas, that, uh, you know, transmission lines go down, 
uh, inadequate weatherization of uh, gas and oil powered infrastructure um, contributes to outages. That's more the Texas context. We don't have to worry necessarily about inadequate weatherization. However, clean energy technology like a battery storage system allows the grid to operate more consistently over time. Now, that's a lot. Let's speed up to what we can do right now. And I want to, and I haven't talked about a fair number of other parts of this uh, puzzle and this campaign, but right now, um, uh, there are actions that you can take. And uh, MCAN went into litigation uh, against that professional association, MWIC. MWIC went to DPU and said, we need financing. And that's when uh, the Wakefield Town Councilor came to us. And so I decided we're gonna go and try to stop this through the only legal channel open um, to anybody, to an organization or to a ratepayer. And we entered into uh, litigation with the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, and they said, no, MCAN, you're not going to be granted what is called uh, intervener status. So we were not, nobody was, no organization, no other ratepayer was granted full legal authority to challenge this plan, which is amazing. This thing has been in development for the past six years, flying under the radar. And so here we are. There are no other legal options available to the residents of Peabody or to organizations working in collaboration with them. So where does that leave us? Uh, well, that, and I'm gonna talk about the local PBD group in a minute, but where that leaves mass climate action is that we are continuing to mobilize state, uh, advocates statewide because this is a statewide problem. And one thing you can do is send a letter to your legislator asking Governor Baker to reopen what is called the MEPA process, to reopen uh, a process that would allow for and require an environmental review. Um, so uh, MCAN is working with, in addition to that, uh, local boards of health who uh, following the uh, board of health from Peabody are uh, writing letters. We've had four boards of health submit letters from participating uh, municipal utility communities, again, to Governor Baker saying, please do an environmental impact review. And FYI, uh, the site is undergoing uh, uh, site prep for construction. This is uh, within the timeline that MWIC had proposed uh, to begin construction. So it's happening. Um, and uh, as part of, MCAN's uh, work on making sure that this never happens again. We are convening an upcoming event involving um, the clean energy group that I mentioned, as well as our law firm that does a lot of uh, work on uh, accelerating clean energy options at the local level with industry folks, as well as with municipalities. And in addition, we're gonna have representation from the Western part of the state. This is a state problem. And BEAT, which is an organization we work very closely with, the Berkshire Environmental Action Team, they have been incredibly successful working in the, um, uh, the IOU territory, the investor-owned utility space in coordinating um, funding and resources to support an, uh, a company called Cogentrix, which has uh, a very old, super polluting peaker plant in Pittsfield. And they're making a difference. So the VP of development, I believe is his title, Chris Sherman at Cogentrix is gonna talk about what motivated him and his company to start transitioning their dirty peakers to clean energy storage. It's happening, that's part of the momentum. I wanna conclude here by saying there is a local Peabody group, a community group, Breathe Clean North Shore. And uh, they continue to, we support them uh, with uh, biweekly organizing calls. They continue uh, to oppose this plant in a variety of different creative ways. Tomorrow is a uh, social media day of action. Um, and there is a embedded in this presentation, there is a link to a video that uh, an advocate, a professional filmmaker in Western Mass made about this project. And once I get the toolkit um, that is going to be developed for tomorrow's day of action, I will send it uh, to Kent uh, and all of you. I invite you, 
If you're not on Twitter, if you're not on Facebook, the, the, the reality of our environment today is that that's where so much of our advocacy efforts now happen. So that is coming up, that's tomorrow. And I really invite you all uh, to participate in that. And if you don't know anything about Twitter, but you have a Twitter account, go on Twitter and just look, find Mass Climate Action and just like what we do and re retweet what we do. And that's, that's plenty great. Uh, this is my email. This is our Twitter handle, and these are our other uh, social media uh, contact information. I know that was a lot, um, but I just want to thank you all for being interested in this and for, um, and for being uh, interested in, in making a difference um, on this project. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, and here I am. Now I can see you all. Hi. Um, Ken, so do, I, uh, do you want me to uh, invite yeah, questions? Yeah, Cynthia's going to do the Q and yeah. handle the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. just I, I know there must be many questions, and uh, forgot to encourage people to write them into the chat. But but put your hand up, or, or I've got the the full grid here. Um, what kind of questions are first? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It is overwhelming a little bit to hear all this, but you have really sort of grabbed this issue in such a powerful way and covering so many of the details, all the players. I mean, it was kind of coming clear, very clear through this uh, presentation. What kind of questions do people have for Sarah? John, John, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Hopefully I am unmuted. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sarah, I am so impressed with your knowledge and your uh, con competence in this whole thing. I read business magazines, both in uh, the US and in uh, Massachusetts. And they have a lot of articles by people who say, Basically, we can't keep the grid going unless we do more natural gas. Now, but let me just can finish and then I'd love your response. Sure. Because it's five to 10 years before solar and all these other things can actually replace enough electricity. And meanwhile, everybody is using more electricity. And if the electric cars and all that, so the demand for electricity will increase. And so they're saying, let us do these natural gas things because otherwise the grid will be in danger. Now, I don't know how you deal with that comment, but I think that's a very common one thought by business people, just so yeah. you know. Thank you, John. Yeah. Yes, thank, can, I can I reply? Yes, please. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so thank you, John. Uh, I hear this uh, a lot. Um, and I think it's a very short-sighted, narrow-minded approach to thinking about managing the grid. And I think, uh, so I wanna be very clear here. Uh, MCAN's position is that gas is not a bridge fuel. Uh, the time has come and gone for that. Uh, and these conversations that emphasize, you know, we're gonna be drawing more electricity off the grid with electric vehicles, uh, with all electric buildings. That is, that's true. What that comment fails to lift up or to add on is that we do need um, more energy efficiency and more uh, energy conservation measures on the books, right? We're not we're not really great at conserving energy at all, you know. And 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 this um, uh, and it really and there are other there are other issues, John, about this whole idea of reliability, energy reliability on the grid, you know the uh, the volatility of prices in the gas market, they are swinging really high and really low. And, and you know, and the price of gas is going up and up. The price of oil is really going up and up. And some of this is the, you know, it, it is related to, bear with me, is related to OPEC dynamics. Some of it is related to, frankly, how New England's energy market is structured. And for example, um, Renewable energy sources uh, in something called the forward capacity market in the energy market specifically designed for peaker plants and capacity resources like that 
right? The, uh, the prices uh, for renewable energy sources are not competitive compared to fossil fuel related um, prices for fossil fuel related kinds of energy. And so there are a series of reforms that need to happen to facilitate uh, the modernization of the grid to ensure that there is minimal disruption, that there is minimal hardship created, especially for, uh, for low-income folks um, who I fear, as we talk about all electric buildings, and I'm getting ready to uh, make comments at the um, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Electricity uh, Committee hearing tomorrow morning about all electric buildings. Um, as we think about transitioning our buildings from the majority of residential buildings in Massachusetts are heated with fossil fuels, as we think about making sure that they have clean energy uh, in their all electric uh, futures. Um, uh, I'm sorry, my thought just left my head. Here it is, it came back to me. We don't want low income ratepayers to be stranded on super duper expensive oil and gas as renewables uh, become more accessible to the middle and upper classes. Mm -hmm. So there is a class issue that lays over all of this. Um, and so this question, John, I really appreciate it. The grid is complex. How we manage the grid is really complicated, unfortunately. But there are, you know, I think about this as an ecologist, frankly, there are like higher scaled reforms that need to happen. We have to reform uh, how we regulate uh, renewable energy in the forward capacity market. That's an ISO New England reform. We have to reform, frankly, how the DPU gives organizations and, um, and ratepayers full legal standing and making sure this plant and a plant like this never gets built again in the state. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody had had intervener status, this thing would never have been approved. So there's yeah. that kind yeah. of reform to it. So I'll just, and then there's the reform of the municipal light plants themselves. Yeah. And because they are under-resourced, you know, MCAN is spending a lot of our time in conversations uh, with advocates, but also with municipal utility staff. What do you need? How can we help you get more money, more technical advice, more technical assistance on ramping up your energy efficiency program, mm -hmm. on ramping up your whole house weatherization program? So there's a, on making sure that your investments in capacity resources are clean. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple other questions, Sarah. Sorry. Yeah, we've got one from um, Kathy German. Kathy, you have to unmute yourself. I'm interested in this issue of um, legal status. Ah. And, you know, what does it take if a resident doesn't have it? and a statewide uh, environmental group doesn't have it, who does have it? Right, this is a great question, Catherine. This is something that uh, MCAN's council and I, we've drafted an article for publication about this very issue. So uh, the Department of Public Utilities back in 1985, uh, uh, granted intervener status to a community member. And when you are granted intervener status, that means you can challenge a project, you can enter into cross-examination, you can present evidence, uh, you can submit a brief, um, and you can you know, enter into what we consider full litigation. So this community member, um, I forget this gentleman's name, uh, was very vocal and uh, you know, attended all of the meetings that DPU held uh, for projects, uh, uh, presumably most of them were fossil fuel based projects back in that day. And at some point, the Department of Public Utilities said, no more, you're done. Uh, you're, you're too vocal uh, and you're disrupting the process. And that was in the early 1990s. I think that was like 1992. And ever since then, it's my understanding from our lawyer that the Department of Public Utilities has been what I call gatekeeping intervener status. They have been withholding, they have been using their discretion about who gets it in a way that uh, does not allow anyone to get it. 
Now, the same groups that have been grant not allowed intervener status in Massachusetts have been allowed uh, intervener status in New Hampshire. Same rules on the books, okay? So this is a cultural problem within DPU. As a result of MCAN's experience, um, and I was in communication with folks at the Attorney General's office, uh, there was a there is a stakeholder group that has been formed, uh, convened by the AG's office. It includes MCAN and includes Green Roots. Oh, good, 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 right? good. Yes, because of the East Boston substation. Um, and so, you know, the sister, so there's DPU and then there's the uh, Energy Facilities Siting Board, and they have different standards for intervener status, right? And the EFSB lets anybody come in, not, you know, in a good way, right? Whereas DPU, nobody. So this stakeholder uh, group is really focused on coming up with feasible, politically feasible uh, fixes to a whole host of problems, but one of them is intervener status. And I could go on for a much longer time period. You know, we need to compensate people for intervener status. It's super expensive. It cost MCAN $50,000 for that alone wow. to file that. So okay. this is I'm really glad good. that you're doing yeah I'm glad that you're doing that because I think the legal challenges I mean we just passed this the clean energy law and they're not even adhering to it I mean I just think that that is that is absolutely ridiculous yes I agree okay we've got a, a couple question. other questions um Dick Dick Perkins yes Sarah thanks so much for the good work that you're doing I'm curious are there currently battery powered Peaker stations that could be pointed to that, you know, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not a diagram or a, but a actually in operation system. Uh, yes, Holyoke, Sterling, uh, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. So, you know, there is precedent in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and that's, that's the real conundrum. You know, I mean, we opened up this call by saying there's momentum. But there's also precedence here. And uh, um, the logic, I will share this about uh, MWIC, the professional association that has secured the financing for the PVD Peaker. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember, this is a revenue generating piece of infrastructure. And the idea that Mr. DeCurzio, the CEO of MWIC, has said to me over and over, he's like, Sarah, this thing is going to generate revenue for these uh, municipal light plants so that they can then take that revenue and invest it in clean energy projects. That's their logic. Mm -hmm. And they now remember like these municipal light plant utilities, they're under-resourced. So on the one hand, I kind of appreciate the logic. On the other hand, why do we need this dirty energy middle ground if our goal, MCAN and MWIC's shared goals are the same. We want more clean energy being generated and distributed by our municipal light plant utilities. Having dirty energy in the mix just kind of, that's not what, that's not how MCAN wants to see that goal yep. realized. Good, thank you. Are those plants that are already, the peaker plants that are already battery operated, is there any you know information about them that could, convince people that this is the way to go? Let me be clear, right? I didn't fully understand your question. So the battery storage projects in Massachusetts are not with Pico plants. They're with kind of other, other kinds of energy resources. Uh, um, the other Pico plants around the country include one that are using battery storage, include one in Oakland, California, there, there's one coming online in Massachusetts in 2024. That's been approved. And there is one coming online in Maine pretty soon. So a peaker plant itself, um, uh, that's why the work of BEAT and Cogentrix, and remember Cogentrix owns one of the biggest, dirtiest peakers in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. That uh, plant, uh, under Mr. Sherman's leadership is transitioning to battery storage technology. Mm -hmm. Good. We've got time for one more. Let's see. We have, we have Frank and then to Kent. Frank, we're just going to kind of move along in the Q&A here. So we'll take two more. Frank, 
Go ahead from down um, south there. <laughs> so I was wondering, going off a little bit on Mr. Appleton's question, I was wondering if it was possible for there to be somewhat of like the battery power thing is probably fairly expensive. Would it be possible to instead do something um, that could be based off of biodiesel? Well, I'm not sure what you mean, uh, Frank, by expensive. If you recall that slide, I showed the annualized, the costs of investing in a four hour, a two hour battery storage system compared to the oil and gas system. And both the four and the two hour system came in significantly under cost compared to the, uh, the uh, gas and oil powered mm -hmm. system. So I actually think uh, it's a misnomer. And we're, and we're talking about a utility scaled project, right? So we're talking millions of dollars um, that MWIC has um, and could easily redirect their investment uh, into battery storage technology. And, uh, and biodiesel, you know, I say no more diesel, right? Again, I think uh, biodiesel, burning biodiesel is still a polluting, it still generates uh, pollution. Burning biomass, you know, if you've been following the, the Palmer plant out in Springfield, uh, it really wanted to, it wanted to burn uh, more organic debris that just puts in really nasty particulates in the air again. So I think when, so I'll just, uh, I'll just say this, uh, 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 Frank, that when MCAN thinks about centering uh, the health and well-being of very vulnerable people, people living in frontline and environmental justice communities already exposed to so many polluting facilities, one criteria for whether or not we put forward biomass, uh, biodiesel, clean energy technology, is that what are the health impacts? What are the health outcomes for people living adjacent to a facility? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the recent siting reform bill that uh, the TUE committee heard last week was all about this issue, right? As the grid, going back to John's question, as the grid modernizes, right, we cannot afford uh, MCAN's position is that we cannot afford to put any other polluting or um, unnecessary energy infrastructure in already overburdened communities, mm. right? That is, from, from my perspective as the ED of MCAN, that is, what energy, that is part of what energy justice is about. Good, thank you, thank you. Ken, let's take your question. Uh, I just... Uh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, just quickly, I, you mentioned a couple of times that these various entities make money from the power plant, even when it's not generating. And I suspect that may be related to GSEP and this right. ability to use rate payers mm. uh, rates to offset their investments. Is that is that basically what the explanation is for how they can? That's make part, yeah, that's a large part of it. But then there are uh, and this is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around, you know, the, the very way that uh, the forward capacity market is structured, right? So it's not only about, you know, uh, you know exploiting ratepayers, but it's also undervaluing, um, uh, uh, undervaluing renewable energy sources um, and how that undervaluing uh, just makes renewable energy sources and clean energy technology uncompetitive non-competitive in that market. Mm -hmm. And um, one of our partner organizations called Community Action Works, they're leading on an ISO, a reforming of ISO New England. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know a whole lot about that campaign, but again, it's that looking one scale up above you. Um, you know, what's happening in these energy markets gets played out in, in how a professional association like MWIC decides to invest uh, in a fossil fuel option for a, a peaker plant. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Sarah, thank you so much. This has been just incredible um, to, to learn about what MCAN is doing and you're, you're doing, and you're certainly very passionate and knowledgeable about all of these issues. And you can tell you're out there in the forefront working with all the different players and, and uh, knocking on doors and, and convening people to 
to uh, and thank you for educating us today. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and if any of you are interested in, uh, you know, uh, connecting with me, um, you know, my email will be in the slide deck that I send to yep. Ken. Thank you. And uh, you're more than welcome. We have chapter calls the first Monday of every month, and Kent has been attending uh, those recently. Um, but we also have a, um, a bi weekly statewide advocates call uh, focused specifically on continuing to oppose the PBD Peaker. Um, um, so Good. those are just two, uh, two organizing spaces, if you will, if you want to be more involved in, in organizing around um, these issues. And lastly, you know, don't forget day of action tomorrow. Once I get that toolkit, um, I'll pass it along. And you know, Twitter matters. Unfortunately, that's reality right now, and it's all about volume. And so you get it to Kent, and and we'll get it in our inbox, right? Yeah, Kent? and we'll we'll be updating <laughs> we'll be updating our action list with material that yes. uh, yeah. Sarah's going to send. Uh, yes. Hopefully, we'll get that online yeah. tomorrow. Yes. We have we have a couple more things to talk about in this meeting. So I'm going to ask Kent. Kent's going to talk about our environmental checklist. Dory's going to give us an update on the future of heat. And Julie's going to talk to us a little bit more about siding. So hang in there, yeah. everybody. Well, and, in the interest um, of time, I, I'm going to I'm going to pass. <laughs> you're going to pass. And, and right. follow up by email, and maybe Dory can be next to talk about. The future of heat. Well, Kent, I, I would just love it if you would show the checklist because I, I would I would just like to refer to that um, in urging people to uh, take action on the future of heat bill. I, I think it's okay. Well, st well, go yeah. ahead and start talking and, and I'll bring it up then. If that's okay. I don't have it ready to hand, but I'll get it. Um, Okay, just or I can, I can explain I the checklist. Read. Explain the checklist. Some people here might not know what it is. Um, th so the ch checklist is um, the steering committee's attempt to just succinctly state concise things that you can do um, uh, to follow up on some of these issues. And so we tried to just find a set that was focused and, you know, not, it was focused and not too lengthy. And kind of trying to recreate some of the energy that we had around the voter action initiative where, um, <clears throat> where an issue can feel so overwhelming, but you wanna know, okay, what can I sit down and do in an hour? And I so um, agree with, with Sarah's remarks that <clears throat> in this day and age, you know, it's not about giving thoughtful testimony and, and all that. It's really about calling, sending emails, tweeting, um, and, and stuff on Facebook. So that, that's the world that we live in now. Um, and um, so in terms of the future, two pieces of legislation that we've been tracking are the Future of Heat and the Siding Act. And so uh, on the Future of Heat, I did testify um, and that takes a lot of time, but the important thing now is that we want the um, Joint Committee on Telecommunications, um, Utilities and Energy to vote that, <clears throat> potential piece of that potential bill out of committee with a favorable um, um, indication towards the whole legislature. Because, you know, the Massachusetts legislature has a two year cycle. So this is our chance for, for a while now to push this bill um, through to success. Um, and so uh, you can see, we've got four suggestions there in terms of the future of heat um, of stuff that you can do. I mean, first learn about it. <laughs> And then click on those links and you can figure out whether your own representative or senator is co-sponsoring. That bill does have a lot of co-sponsors. If somehow your representative or senator is not co-sponsoring, then that's a particular avenue that you can pursue. But the thing I'd really love you to do is before February 2nd, let's say, to call up um, <clears throat> the joint committee and call either Senator Barrett um, or Oh my goodness, who's the name of the other um, co-lead of the telecommunications committee? But anyway. Jeff Roy. Jeff Roy. Roy. Thank you. Roy, um, mm -hmm. Representative Roy. <clears throat> you call them up, you won't get them. You'll get an administ you'll get someone on their staff and just say, please tell Senator Barrett or Representative Roy that I think it's really important that the committee vote out um, this piece of legislation with a favorable reprimand. And so that'll take 30 seconds or something. Um, 
And then the other thing you could do is try and um, tell more of your friends about the importance of this. Um, it's a, we've already discussed the future of heat legislation in a prior um, talk, but it's got some really important ingredients in it, some of which would really um, change uh, parts of, of the GSEP program that I researched. So let me stop there and- um, yep. Let and I'll just say, Kent, if Kent yeah. scrolls down a little bit more, Kent, mm -hmm. I think there are sample letters there too. Oh, yeah, I forgot yes. about yeah. that. So it's like you, you don't have to invent it. <laughs> yeah, you can copy and paste yeah. and send it to some friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So it's a, so, a terrific checklist, and um, Kent showed how to get to it. Yeah. On so if you, if, you, if you go to our website, environmental, <laughs> King's Chapel Environmental Action, .html, uh, now near the top in magenta, <laughs> you can get right to our checklist. Yeah. And we'll Good. be updating this, as I say, uh, with Sarah's latest thoughts on the PBD Good. plant actions. Good. Good. Okay, we're going to move to Julie. Julie, you were going to talk to us about citing. Just, just briefly, my friends, I can't hold a candle to Sarah and, and to Dory, but I have adopted the citing reform bill as as my target area and trying so hard to get up to speed. I told Kent I was reading the enabling legislation over the years for environmental justice. It's been with us a long, long time. And and the roadmap bill, especially recently, um, has made it so important that that all communities are heard and there are so many of them. And my research on this is they're all over the greater Boston area. There are so many power plants and the, and the energy facilities um, siting board has perhaps begun to listen to community voices, but um, not, not everybody agrees that they've been heard. And I think that this reform bill is going to make a huge difference in the attention to the health impacts, the cumulative uh, health impacts and, and environmental impacts on these communities. Um, I, I have figured out that Mothers Out Front um, is a really great uh, group to attend with on the matter of being heard by our legislators to promote the bill out of committee and on uh, to move it out of committee. That's the deadline in February we're working toward and um, uh, power forward, what is it called forward? Power Mass forward. power forward is another umbrella group that is pulling together people, teaching them how to make those advocacy phone calls to their legislators. Um, I'm not a Twitter person, but I think this is as good a reason as any to engage because if if the technology can make an impact here, let's do it. Um, I'm I'm very excited that this momentum has has built to the point where so many people are coming together to make this change. Um, and I thank you for for your help um, in informing us, Sarah and and Dory also, and there's a long way to go, but I think the time is right to dive right in and take these links and follow them <laughs> and, yeah. and onward, you know, it's, yeah. it's a great time. I, I will be, um, I'll be advocating to my, to Senator Bar Barrett is my legislator and I'll be talking with his office on the 20th at noon under the mass power forward, they're doing another pull together people to um, to sound off, and it's it's a great opportunity. That's and great. mothers out front, I think, is is assembling calls. You know, these regular calls to get people together and mm -hmm. to make you know make a difference, make their voices heard. So that's Thank about you, all. Julie. I can yeah. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Thank you. Kent, do you have any last words and then I'll close? Yeah, I, well, uh, or just should I, say, should well, I... well, I want you to do the closing and all I'm gonna say is that we'll follow up with our uh, schedule uh, by email, but we hope to have another meeting uh, next month and yeah. uh, probably along these same lines. So yeah. 
Thank you again, Sarah, and uh, over, over to Cynthia. And thank you, Kent, for your leadership in, in moving us along. Um, I, I've been involved with the environmental action at King's Chapel now for um, a little over a year, and uh, my inbox gets so many emails from different organizations right now <laughs> because I've been signing up for one and the next one and the next issue and the next, and they link to another issue. And I get a little overwhelmed sometimes, but I think having these meetings um, really makes, makes, gives us a sense of what we can do, learn a little bit more from people who are taking action. If, you know, And so I wanna end with um, uh, my husband Dick's brother, uh, recently, and his wife recently met with Joanna Macy out in the West Coast. She's a 92, a lifelong environmentalist. I must say lifelong because she's still very much at it. Joanna said to him, because he, he was like kind of overwhelmed himself. And she said, aren't we lucky to be alive when the world needs us so much? <laughs> I thought that was a great, a great uh comment. And then I want to end with a poem called The Gift, because I think all of our work comes out of the fact that we know, as Frank reminded us, that we're doing this for, for this place we call the earth and, and our place on it and in it. This is by Mary Oliver. Be still, my soul, and steadfast. Earth and heaven both are still watching. Though time is draining from the clock, and your walk that was confident and quick has become slow. So be slow if you must, but let the heart still play its true part. Love still as once you loved deeply and without patience. Let God and the world know you are grateful that the gift has been given. Let God and the world know you are grateful that the gift has been given. I'm very grateful for all these faces on my screen and for Sarah being here and all of you for joining us today. Thank you. So Thank you, Sarah. Thank you again, Sarah. My pleasure. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Bye, all. Till next Good night. time. Till we meet again. Till we meet again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.